We're going to get started. Louder? You mean? I'll just have you sneeze. <laughs> oh. 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 Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, for our first session this morning, um, we have with us uh, Jeff Hanapel. Uh, Mr. Hanapel is uh, currently the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs with the Policy Group. Um, he has represented the metal finishing industry um, on environmental health and safety regulatory issues for the past 17 years. His 30 years of experience includes work for several DC-based law firms, the government contractors supporting several EPA offices, and the US EPA's Office of Solid Waste. Um, Jeff has a Bachelor's of Biology from Notre Dame University. He has done graduate work in zoology and wildlife management from Southern Illinois University. He has a Master's in Law from Vermont Law School and a law degree from Georgetown University. So, has a lot of experience and I think he's got a really good presentation offered. So, everybody welcome Jeff. Thank you, Brent. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here among you and, and a pleasure to experience snow on May 18th anywhere in the, uh, in, in the U.S. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a, a rule in um, why we're here and why we're talking about this this old old rule. But before I, I do, um, maybe just a, a little bit about the service finishing industry, who we are and what we do. Um, in fact, this is a difficult question for us to answer sometimes. Um, we we use this for when we go up on Capitol Hill with the with the industry to touch who we are. And we ended up developing these little uh, sheets uh, in conjunction with the Nickel Institute. And there's a picture of a plane, car, kitchen, uh, laptop, phone. And what we did is we identified in those dots where there is plating that, that occurs. And if you look at these, this is just nickel plating um, that, that we've done. But it kind of gives you an idea. And I always tell the story. Um, those of you from Michigan know Senator Debbie Stabenow, um, you know, big automotive state. We've been going for years and years trying to explain <coughs> what plating is, what we do. Um, and we took this into her and handed it to her and she said, wow, I didn't realize there was that much plating on a car. Um, and we said, well, yeah, there is, and that's just nickel. And actually we've done another car, um, we have a blue car that has all of the plating on it. Now, um, what does the plating do? Primarily it's corrosion protection um, that we use it for, but also in a lot of electrical stuff, it improves um, the performance of it. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> and it makes things look better too. Um, and actually, because of that, a lot of parts that we put metal onto, they last a lot longer. And so um, you're not having to replace things as much. Um, we do a lot of work with the military, a lot of work aerospace, automotive, electronics, um, heavy equipment, and a lot of hydraulics and all. So, that's kind of what we do, and we are, um, it's an interesting industry because we really don't make anything. We kind of take products and we apply things on to make those products better um, on that. So we kind of, we're in an interesting place in the supply chain. On it. But we're everywhere, and um, whether you realize it or not, you're touching plating every day, um, most uh, commonly with your with your cell phones, so they wouldn't work without uh, without plating. So actually, we just had our Washington um, forum in April, and we had the Bureau of Printing and Engraving from Washington D.C. They have a plating shop um, to they 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 plate on to the plates where they make dollar bills. Um, so now we like to say you can't make money without plating. Um, so just to kind of give you give you a sense of kind of what it is, it's really kind of difficult sometimes to get your, get you a feel for what we're doing. Um, so let's talk about this rule, the plating and polishing, or 6W, I guess. But how, how many of you, I mean, I assume most of you have plating that you, that you deal with. Um, 
Well, there you have it. You didn't say raise your hand. You okay. Have to be very direct with us. All right. <laughs> it's early, and uh, I just, well, this rule, and I just want to kind of get the start at the beginning in terms of the question is why are we here and why are we talking about this? Um, my first knee jerk reaction is I don't know. And I'll tell you later why that is not as flippant as it sounds. Um, but the, one of the reasons why we're here is because of the relationship um, that you have with EPA and that you reached out to us. Um, and that's part of the reason why we're, but I'm gonna start at the beginning to understand kind of this rule and where did it come from? And I know you guys, your origins is in the AIR program. And so you'll, you'll appreciate this and understand this. Um, this rule is one of the area source rules, um, and it came about through the Clean Air Act amendments on there. Um, and they had to identify area sources. And actually, in the terms of a court order that came out of it, EPA was required to issue emission standards for 55 different area source standards. Um, as part of that whole package, and as part of their integrated urban air toxic strategy, what they needed to do is they had to find 90% of the emissions of these 30 hazardous air pollutants out of those source categories and then achieve 75% reduction from that. That is really key to, to start the, the reduction of cancer incidents in this and getting those emissions down. It's key to why this rule even came, came to be. Um, um, Planning policy came out in 2008. Again, you're wondering, why are we dealing with it now? Um, so, uh, it is a rule that's going to deal with the HAPs that we have, cadmium, chromium, lead, manganese, and nickel compounds. Um, it includes all of the <laughs> plating processes. Um, there's electrolytic where you have electric current. There's uh, electrolysis where you use chemical reactions to get the metal onto the part. Um, there's some that use heat um, that helps the, the transfer on that. But it really covers everything. Um, interesting, the rule has no emission limits and just some management practices um, as practicable, and we'll we'll dig into that that term a little bit more. That's part of the uh, part of the beauty of this rule, and it's part of the uh, the bane of its existence and, and and yours on this. I like to say this rule um, is the rule that's not really a rule, um, and you'll see a little bit. You'll see why as we we go into it later. We, we actually work with EPA to develop this this rule. There's some other requirements for some specific processes, and we'll walk through that. And then some of the notification and record keeping requirements that are part of this rule. But again, to answer the question, why are we here? Um, EPA Region 5, actually, was some, somebody was, I think the guy from Minnesota was up here talking, and uh, one issue you guys were talking about, he was saying, God, all you other regions are really great. Our region seems to be really hard on us. I don't understand why. And I was sitting in the back kind of laughing to myself, because you're in Region 5. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's, uh, and those of you who are in Region 5, you really understand that. Um, region 5 tends to be very independent and very aggressive on, on a lot of issues, um, which in the uh, in industry, when we heard the rumor that uh, they were thinking about getting rid of uh, EPA Region Five and consolidating, and I think with Region Seven, there was a lot of there was a lot of joy in, in the regulated community that perhaps Region Five maybe uh, um, don't think that's going to happen uh, and all. But Region Five has has played a very interesting um, role <laughs> in, in, in all of this. But what they did is they identified some compliance issues um, on this. They they had done some inspections and gone out, and that what they were saying there was some primarily paperwork issues, but they asserted some facilities did not have proper controls. It's a little surprised me and all, um, but the good news is, is that rather than kind of go through a full flung enforcement initiative, they reached out to you guys. They reached out to the, the reps, the, the small business uh, reps in region five and said, hey, could you work with the industry, see if we can you know, facilitate compliance and, and, and further this along, which, you know, all the credit to first EPA Region 5 for first doing that, because they could have just gone in and just started enforcing. And number two, credit to you guys for reaching out to us to kind of work with you on that. And that's what we're, we're trying to, to do. We've had a dialogue, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. We've done, um, so actually we went to EPA Region 5, um, where the, the Region 5 states were having a, a meeting and did a little training session on that kind of, Plating 101, a little bit about the rule. <coughs> what I'm going to talk about will be 
old hat for those folks in terms of kind of going through the, the rule. And then we are working and we'll talk about some of the things that we are working on together to, to help this out and kind of culminating where we are today here at the, today's meeting. Okay, let's talk more about the rule and kind of dig down to, and if, if I go along and you have any questions, please shoot it up. You know, sometimes I forget that plating is kind of in my DNA, um, if, if you will, and so I forget. So if there's something that I make a reference to or kind of slide over, please shoot up. Uh, as I said, there's no, no such thing as stupid questions, just stupid people. Okay? <laughs> so so I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not going to get any questions now, right? <laughs> All right. Talk about first the, the, the haps. Cadmium, chromium, lead, manganese, and, and nickel. I mean, that pretty much covers. There's others that we we deal with, uh, a lot of tin, a lot of silver, a lot of precious metals, um, <coughs> but they are covered um, by the, this rule. Part, they're not haps um, on there. I think zinc is is one, but those are the ones that were chosen for this, this rule. One of the things that at the time of the rule, EPS estimated there's approximately 2,900 facilities. Um, that's probably high. We've been doing some research um, with POTWs on water rules and going around, I think, in, in LA, Chicago, Milwaukee, Cleveland, um, New York, and we have seen a 30 to 40 percent decline in the number of uh, metal finishing facil uh, facilities um, nationwide since like 1992. So I would probably put that number closer to 2,000 on that, and probably about half of those would be our members. Okay, this is really important as, as kind of what they were thinking about the, the rule. And as they went through the, the rule, they said they didn't think that any additional controls were needed for this industry for this, this rule. Um, the industry had successfully reduced air emissions, um, and they had reduced emissions um, by 95%, approximately 20, 20 tons. So the baseline year for that uh, urban air toxics strategy was 1995. So as they were doing this rule, looking from 1995, the industry had reduced by 20 tons um, of HAPs on that. And EPA said they didn't anticipate any further reductions as a result of this rule after they, they finalized that. Um, and that what they wanted to do was kind of maintain the industry where they were, okay? Um, one of the interesting things, and, and I think it's a pretty good indication is that EPA actually estimated the average cost on an annual basis for the facility was just over a thousand dollars. Now, uh, when I see cost estimates from EPA, um, I usually multiply by 10. Um, it's usually a pretty good, pretty good thing. But to see EPA come out with a number um, as low as it did um, on this also gives another indication that they really weren't looking for a whole lot. Um, from a thousand dollars on an annual basis for compliance is, is is really not much. This is actually the language from the Federal Register notice in there that kind of says the same thing. It did. Why this is important is that the only reason reasons that EPA did this rule was first by court order. This is one of the area sources that it had to do. And number two, it needed the 20 tons of emissions reduction that this industry had already um, had as part of its urban air toxics strategy. So they didn't need to put any additional controls, but they needed those 20 tons to add into that, so to add up to their, their total. And the reason why I'm going into excruciating detail on this, it really kind of gets at the whys for this rule. And one of the reasons why when we look at this rule and why we're dealing with it now is that I look at it, we're, we're one generation away um, from inspectors on this. When the rule came out, we had that generation of inspectors. We've counted now a new generation of inspectors and they're looking at this rule and they're thinking, there's gotta be more to this rule than is really on paper. And my message is, has always been, no, there's not. And there may even be less than, than, than you think. And part of it comes from what EPA's thinking was. Now, I had the advantage of us sitting at the table with EPA as we were developing this rule. 
And so we were working with them. And actually, it was really an interesting dynamic. They were kind of saying, help us. We have to do a rule. Can you help us design a rule um, that, that we can put in there that doesn't put too much burden on the industry, but that looks like a rule? Um, and that is kind of the, kind of the layman's way of, of approaching this. <clears throat> okay. To understand what the rule applies to, let's understand what it doesn't apply to. Um, first, it doesn't apply to chromium electroplating. Um, and the reason why, because there's another niche app for that. So hard chromium plating, decorative chromium plating, and chromium anodizing, basically, with any of those processes. Those are covered by the chromium electroplating niche app um, and are not covered by this rule. Basically, it covers everything else that uses cadmium, chromium, lead, and nickel. And they have the de minimis amounts, uh, concentrations of less than 0.1% by weight uh, for cadmium, chromium, lead, and nickel, and concentrations of less than 1% by weight for, for manganese. So if you're using materials at those low, lower than that, um, you're not covered by this rule. So is that chromium all trivalent, or is it all? All chromium compounds. Okay, and that's what, when, you, when you're dealing with HAPs, HAPs are always the compound for it. So, and some of that chromium will be hexavalent, and some of it will be trivalent. Some of the chromating processes that they have, and some of it is hexavalent. A lot of that is, there's, there's a change in the industry to move over to trivalent wherever they can. But it's important, and that's a good question, it's important to know all of these are all metal compounds of those of those halves okay now if you're using processes that have metals other than those halves you're not covered by this rule okay or those processes are not going to be covered by this rule and that's really an important uh, distinction on this um, the usual is educational purposes or the thermal spray for repairing surfaces that's primarily um, DOD um, operations the uh, replacement for hard chrome Yes. What other, what other elements are used for plating? The ones that aren't regulated. You know what? Just about any metal there is. Some of the common ones would be zinc, tin, a lot of the precious metals. Um, Can you repeat the question so our recording? Oh, I'm I'm sorry. John asked what other uh, metals are, are are used in plating. Um, so tin, zinc, um, precious metals, and then copper. Um, is, is, is a big one. Copper is used a lot as a base um, that you put other metals on top of because it, it adheres really well. Um, but I would say any metal you got, because um, like we've get into, you get into some niche applications, titanium um, on there, palladium, all that, and, and some of the DOD has some really specific um, instances. But in the electronics, a lot of silver and gold. On that, and one of the things to keep in mind when I'm talking about this, it is very, very thin layers. And, and the best way to describe this, and Rhonda knows uh, one of our players, Sam Bell in California. When we come to Washington, Sam would take dimes and we'd gold plate them. Okay, and when you went up on Capitol Hill, you'd give a gold plated dime to somebody in the south to kind of it, it was a it was, it was a great visual in terms of this is what we do, and people would always ask, "What's it worth? It's got gold on it." Well, there's two answers to that. One is it's worth a dime, okay, because <laughs> it's a dime. But the amount of gold on there is so small. Um, that's a, but then Sam Bell, and Lorana knows he's, he's quite a character. Sam's other answer to that is it's worth whatever you can negotiate for. Because he said many times you'd be sitting at a bar and show one of the bartenders say, can I have one? And then that's when Sam would begin to negotiate what that, that gold-plated dime would be. Um, so, but it, it's important to know. And that's one of the things of why plating is so effective is that as opposed to paint, for example, if you're putting paint on surfaces, the paint is gonna be relatively thick. If you're putting metal plating on things, it's very, very thin on that. And I, you know, I use the gold dime thing just to let you know, you, you, you think gold on something, um, there is so little gold on that. It is such a thin layer that it really doesn't add um, much value to it. Um, the other thing is uh, dry mechanical polishing um, prior to plating. And it's one of the 
kind of the funny little things we'll talk a little bit about polishing. This is the plating and polishing rule. Um, and what the industry has done with polishing is there's ways to get around being covered by this. But one distinction of this, any polishing done prior to plating is not covered by that. After plating, um, it, it can be covered. Okay, compliance deadlines on this, the old rule. So it's, it's, it's in effect. One interesting thing, exemption from Title V permits. This is something you see a lot in the area of source rules, particularly small, small sources. And again, you know, when you see tons, um, you know, 25 tons, and you're dealing with particulate matter and <coughs> ozone, <coughs> you, can get up to, you can get up to tons pretty quickly. These guys are emitting pounds per year on most of this, this stuff. Um, so clearly, Title V wouldn't be applicable, and it, EPA saw early on what a burden, particularly small businesses, Title V is, um, and wherever they can on rules, they would provide exemptions on that. The other thing important on, on these areas, the general provisions of the Clean Air Act, those are applicable to all these, these things, too. <laughs> okay. Again, the additional specific process of the labor job will go into some of, of those those things and the notification requirements. And I think, you know, if there's a problem in compliance, this is where it is. Okay. It's the paperwork associated, it's whether facilities have submitted their initial notification to say we're in the program or whether they've submitted their compliance notifications to that. And that's one of the things up front when Renee first contacted us on this. I mean, one of the things first out of the shoot, we said, we probably we agree with there's probably a compliance issue relative to paperwork uh, on this. From a substance standpoint, uh, we don't think there there really is. <laughs> okay, now what we did with EPA in designing management practices that would be applicable. And the management practices, the best way to think, management practices are applicable <coughs> to everything in the rule. Okay, um, there's a couple little exceptions, and but I think every. If you're covered by this rule, you're covered by the management practices. Now, if you look at these management practices, uh, one of the things are, these are things that platers are doing already. Uh, these are the things that, the reason for the 20 ton reduction on that, these are the things. These are great practices. Part of it came, a lot of it came out of the Common Sense Initiative and working with uh, EPA and the Clinton um, administration, um, but a big push on, on P2. Um, things like when you pull a part out of the, the bath, um, if you let it sit there for a little bit longer and have more of it, uh, the plating solution come off the part and into the plating bath as opposed to then taking it to the rinse. Simple little things like that. Uh, also, you can do spraying of it. Um, the other thing to minimize in, in a bath, one of the things you want to do with the chemicals in there, you want to make sure you get good circulation on that so that you get good distribution of the metal on the part. Um, there's different ways to do that. One is agitating the bath, and a lot of it they had like air, air bubblers in there, and one of the things that does is that you inject air in there, it becomes agitated, and you're gonna get more emissions off of your thing. There are ways to avoid that. Yes? So, while we are in these practices done prior to the reduction, what made the people start using these management practices? Education, outreach, what? All, all of the above and bottom line. And, and, oh, I'm sorry. What was, what was it that brought these management practices about? Why did people start, start doing them? And first, first part of the, the answer to your question is there was no bright line. It, this is kind of a continuum in terms of people implementing these, these practices. Okay, part of that comes from education. Part of it comes from outreach on it. But the other part about it, and it was, it was something that we did as an industry as part of the Common Sense Initiative, we actually measured all of these things. People submitted data, and they were able to demonstrate how much reductions in waste, emissions, um, water discharges that they had as a result of doing these things. And the more we saw this, the more we promote it. And we continue to, to do that. I'll mention something at the very end, something that we're continuing to do on this. Yes. I guess just I would mention that the, by doing <coughs> that, you were able to show that it saved them money 
And that was why they were very much on board with doing these management practices is because ultimately it saved them money in chemicals and product and all of that. Right. And right? It, is that right? It, it's it's actually, yeah. I mean, the business is motivated by that bottom line and if it's a good idea, that's one thing. But if it's a good idea and it saves you money, that's another. And, and a, a good illustration of that is say I have my tank where the plating is going on and I dip it in. And if I quickly pull it out and move it to my rinse tank, I'm taking a lot of solution I'm like that. If I keep doing that, I'm gonna lose more and more of that solution, I'm gonna have to replace it. That's money they're losing. But they found that there are different ways to do this. Um, the reduction, reduction in use of water. This is a water-based industry. Um, if you reduce the amount of water that you're using, you reduce everything at the back end. Um, the pollutants that you're discharging. Um, the energy required in your facility to move water in there. So it's really, it's been an interesting process and I will tell you, we're not done yet. We, we're continuing to focus on pollution prevention uh, practices so that, and we have, a, we have a grant with EPA Region 5 on that. I'll talk a little briefly at, at the end of this, but it, it's, it's an ongoing, ongoing process on this. But, but, you know, even the way you design barrels, plating can be done too. You can put it in a barrel and they tend to be small little pieces. It's like a big plastic barrel and it'll rotate. So you put it in the, the tank and you rotate. It's a way of plating a lot of little tiny, think of like screws. Um, on there's the best the best way to do that. The other way is you put them on racks. Um, you put the parts on racks and the racks go into the thing. The way you design the rack and the barrel um, can be very important in terms of how quickly it drains um, and how you can recover a lot more solution uh, into that. So again, these are, there's now one interesting thing to note if you look at every one of these management practices, the phrase, as practicable, is in every one of them. Okay, and this is where I get at the rule that's not really a rule, okay? Technically, none of these are required, okay? If it's not practical for you to do it. And part of it, part of it is there, there was a good reason for doing that. There's not one plating shop that is the same. They're all a little bit different, they all do a little bit different things. But some of these things just aren't practical for, for them to do. It's the way their, their line may be designed, and maybe the kind of plating that they're doing, the parts that they're doing. And that was part of when we were working with EPA, we said, here, here are these management practices, here's something the industry is doing, but not everybody does all of these uh, on that. So we, we put the phrase in as practical, there are more um, of, of these. Yes. Oh, I have a quick question, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer it, and it's okay. You, know, you mentioned that you had an EPA grant to look at additional P2 practices. Can you name a couple of what you think that those will, the outcomes will be, or are you not far enough along? The question was, uh, can you name some of the P2 practices from your EPA grant? On that, and I, if if you'll be patient, we can we wait on the the answer. To that is kind of yes and no, but I'll talk a little bit more about some of the the P two that we're that, that we're looking at. Um, but so this this notion is as practical. That now on the one side, I said technically none of these are required. On the flip side, I guarantee every plating shop is doing some of these. Some are doing all of them. And this is what we've always told, as part of this rule, we told plating shops, you're doing these things, just make note of it. Okay? And that is the way the rule was designed. We designed these management practices to identify the things that the industry is doing that helps to reduce emissions. Now some of these, I mean, some of the things that, and this is the, the interesting thing about that, and I've seen it more and more, and we've actually tried to use this more and more, in air rules is sometimes in an air rule you put something in that's not necessarily air related but then may have a positive air emission result in that and a lot of these management practices would really go to that now the other thing that to keep in mind is that you know up front i talked about that this doesn't apply to chromium electroplating uh, niche app and there's a reason why we have two separate ones chromium electroplating is a very inefficient process. 
Okay. And what I mean by that is that when you're plating chromium, only 30% of the chromium actually will get on the part. The rest of it is, is going up in emissions. Okay. And that's why you have to control, have to have, whether it's fume suppressants or actually pollution uh, air controls for chromium electroplate, very inefficient process. These other processes that we're talking about are much more efficient. Um, you're getting 90% uh, plus um, plating on that. So as a result, the emissions associated with these plating processes are very small. It's not like chromium. And it's one of the things to understand, and it's been part of the confusion there in, in some of the language that, that's used that was similar to chromium electroplating is used in, in this rule, but it's really important to understand the distinction between the different types of plating processes. Um, I will tell you, our meeting in November at EPA Region 5, we had um, Ray Trine, Trine. Trine was there, and she is the head of the HAPS program at EPA Region 5. Uh, she was not necessarily impressed with my explanation of, uh, of that less efficient thing, and it was really more in terms of, well, there's still emissions coming off. Um, and if there's nickel emissions coming off of nickel plating baths, and we have potential cancer hotspots in there, and we believe that nickel may be associated with that, it may be you guys. Okay, and so that's a, we'll, we'll park that for now, and that's, that's an issue that we're dealing with in a lot of places. Uh, our good friends in Southern California um, are, are kind of focusing on some of these fugitive emissions and some of these other emissions too. Uh, but for the purpose of the rule, we'll, yeah. but again, you look at these, again, just more practice, and if you look at these, it's common sense practices. These are, I mean, even, even outside the plating industry, these are good practices for anybody on there if you've got water-based uh, processes. So these are management practices um, and they're in part. Some of them, uh, I, I think one that had uh, tank covers on there and tank covers are a great idea, but if you're putting parts in and out all day, it's very difficult to have a, a tank cover. So there's one reason why it might not be practicable. Even in situations where tank cover might be good, they said in the rule, if you don't have it, you don't have to get it, even if it might be a good idea. I mean, they, they went that far in the rule to kind of explain some of these things to say that, you know, if you're doing them, do them. Um, and, they, and they will. So that's really the guts of this rule, the management practices. Now, there's a couple of little um, things and we'll, we'll talk about that. Non-cyanide electrolytic processes with a pH less than 12. That's, that's a, lot of, a lot of qualifiers and everything like that. Let me break that down for you. That's almost all the other plating that's, that, that, that's going in. Um, it's electrolytic. Electrolytic means you have a current running through the bath, so that helps you go from the positive or the negative, or the negative to the positive, I forget what it is, but it, it takes the metal in solution and that electrical current then attracts it to the part that's in there. So in very layman's turn, it's what takes that metal that jumps it from the solution onto the part. That's the electrical current that's, that's doing it. Um, and non-cyanide based, the reason why there's a specific uh, requirement for cyanide based. These processes on there, um, you must, you have three options, the way to comply if you have these things. One is the use of a wetting agent or fume suppressant. One, you can install a control device. The other, you can use tank covers 95% of the time, okay? There are three options in the rule. For all intents and purposes, and from the industry standpoint, there is one option for compliance, and that is the use of a wetting agent or a fume suppressant when you're plating that. Um, again, because of these processes are so efficient, the emissions coming off them are not that great. You really don't need that. I would say 95 to 99% of the facilities um, do not have any of these controls on there. If a facility has these type of controls on there, they're there for another reason, not to comply with this rule, but they're there for another reason on that. So for these processes, let's focus on the wetting agent and fume suppressant in that. Now here's where the confusion is really set in. In the chromium electroplating, because it's inefficient, one of the things you do is you use a fume suppressant. Um, and best way to think of it, often like a foam blanket, 
The field suppressant that we have used for years, uh, it's the same thing as Scotch Guard um, that they use for to, to, to kind of keep stains off of. And that's basically what it's kind of a kind of a kind of a blocker. Um, it's a surfactant um, that's on there. It's not used any, anymore, but um, keep in mind is that we use this in chromium electroplating because as that inefficient plating process is and the bubble comes up out of the surface, to prevent it from going up in the air, you have the fume suppressant on top like that. So if the air bubble hits, then it just goes right back in there. That's the, the layman's term on that. Very widespread in chromium, needed, needed very much um, in chromium electroplating. Um, it's not needed in, yes ma'am. But the question was, is there anything been done to kind of increase the plating efficiency for chromium electroplating? And there has been a lot of research on that. Part of it is just the nature of chromium electroplating in part. Um, it is a very aggressive uh, chemical environment that also leads to that. That's the way the chromium electroplating <coughs> works, um, the chromic acid. Um, so the, the short answer is, yeah, there's been work, but nothing very successful on that. And that's, you know, and the, the best way to, to approach that for most folks is find an alternative to chromium electroplating, which is, there, there's a lot of that going on. Um, most people aren't using hexavalent chromium plating now unless they have to, unless their customer wants them to, or there is no alternative. Where there's an alternative to hexavalent chromium, 99% uh, of the people are using it. <coughs> okay, so the wetting agent fume suppressant on this, um, and this came from a lot of discussions in, in, in terms of that. If you have a, a wetting agent or a fume suppressant in your bath, it's gonna help. Um, one way as a surfactant, um, if you have it in your bath, you pull your parts out, uh, that solution is going to come off much, much more easily if you have a wetting agent or fume suppressant in the bath. It's a surfactant, so it's going to make it drain a lot better. Um, almost all plating solutions have a wetting agent in them. Um, and that was music to EPA's ears when they heard this. They were glad of that. Um, and it was one of those things that said, we'll make it a requirement that they have to, to be in there. And again, this is another one of those things, almost a side benefit. Um, the reason why most of the wetting agents were in the plating bath were for other reasons. A lot of it was in brightener packages. Um, to get plating, um, the metal to be brighter once it's, once it's on there, um, they have what they call brightening packages, so it'll be brighter. In those brightening packages are often wetting agents. Without getting too complicated on that, there are wetting agents in almost all plating baths for other reasons, okay? But there is a side benefit that there would be some benefit from an air emission standpoint, um, enhancing some of those management practices that they are there. <clears throat> so the requirement for these processes, which is, which is the lion's share of, of processes covered by this rule, that you have to have a wetting agent, fume suppressant wetting agent. Now, they call it wetting agent fume suppressant in the rule. And the fume suppressant part of the rule has really caused the confusion because when most regulators see fume suppressant, they're thinking chromium electroplating. They're thinking that foam blanket and that's what you need. Um, really, the operational term here should be wetting agent on that. And the requirement is, is that you have to identify the wetting agent that's in your plating bath, use it as prescribed by manufacturer's specifications, generally a chemical supplier on that. Um, and note if you make any additions of the wetting agent to the plating bath. Okay, now because most wetting agents are part of the plating chemistry, and this is, this is the magic of, of, of plating from the supplier's standpoint, they all have they all have their snake oil, if you will. Um, it's basically the same stuff, but they all have it a little bit different, a little bit formulation. Theirs is, 
you know, this company is better than that company because they've got this, but this company says theirs is better for this, that. But they all have it in there. And sometimes they're not as uh, happy to, to give up what all's in there, but we've gotten them to be able to identify for their customers what that wedding agent is. But almost all of it's included in the plating bath. Um, there are some where people will make additions to that. If you put a, an additional brightener package in there that's got the wedding agent, the rule would require you to make note of that addition, when you made that addition, um, and how much on um, that. But that is the, that's, that's the requirement. Note that you have it in there, and if you make additions to it, note when you made the addition and what that amount was. Okay, pretty straightforward thing. I will tell you, and some of you can appreciate this, this has probably caused the most confusion on the rule for that in terms of what those requirements are. That and the fact that um, some think that these two are requirements that you may also have to have, and they wonder why you don't have those other controls on it. Excuse me. Okay, uh, another one of the plating processes is the, what they call short-term or, or flash electroplating. Um, often you, you, you do this, they call it the wood nickel strike. You put a part in very quickly, um, put a very thin, quick flash of nickel on it, and it generally helps for then putting on another layer um, of another metal on this. Um, if to be a short-term electroplating, um, you have to limit the plating time in that tank to no more than one hour a day or three minutes per hour. Um, and here's, here's the funny thing about this rule. <clears throat> if you don't meet the definition of this, you're not short-term electroplating. The only advantage of being short-term electroplating is that if you are, and if you limit it to this, you don't need that, okay? But if you do this process for more than that, you gotta have a wedding agent in there. That is the only difference between those, those two things. And quite frankly, after the rule was written, a guy called up Donald Lee Jones and asked us, did you really mean to do that? It didn't seem like there's anything. He said, yeah, that's, that's what we meant. It's exactly, exactly right. So one of these little kind of things that it's a, it's a distinction without a difference, at least in, in my, my mind. Um, but the only, the only significance is you'd have to use a wedding agent if you were not that. So, and sorry if this is a really ignorant question, but then how, does, how do you differentiate that from subpart N? If they're using chromium? Well, if they're using chromium, they're, they're covered under that niche app. Okay. It provided that they're the processes for the, the, the chromium, and it's decorative chromium, hard chromium plating, and chromium, chromic acid anodizing. So they wouldn't be doing this flash. Right. Okay. Well, if, the, if you're doing chromium electroplating and you did a flash prior to chromium, that flash process would be covered by the plating and polishing niche app, whereas your electroplating, your chromium electroplating processes are covered by the chromium electroplating niche app. Okay, so in a facility, and most of them are this way, if you're doing chromium plating, you're covered by the chromium niche app. Your other processes that aren't covered by the chromium niche app are covered by the plating and polishing niche app. Okay, so most of them are covered by both. Well, yeah, you because know, okay. most of them are doing something other than chromium. So a lot of our facilities that are already under subcarbonate might be also under this. Yes. And I've... I almost guarantee you that they are. Um, it is rare that you will find a plating shop that is just doing, and probably chromic acid anodizer, that may be the one exception. There's some people that's all they do on that. But um, my, my sense is that um, if you have a shop that's doing that, take a closer look, because they're probably doing some other process that's covered by this. Yes? Did I miss that? The question was, uh, does, does the rule say that if you're subject to subpart N, you're not subject to this rule? That's the best way to look at processes that are covered by subpart N are not covered by this. 
but facilities, because what most facilities you're going to have your subpart end processes covered by that, and you have other processes, and they're not saying that those are unregulated. Okay, they're going to be regulated, so you're you're going to have two niche apps. Not not uh, an uncommon um, thing for most facilities to be covered by more than one niche app at facilities. So these are just two plating ones that are that are covered. Okay, uh, continuous electroplating processes. Um, you've got to use tank cover 70% of the operation and also use a wetting agent in that. What these are, these continuous, um, they're often called real to real. Um, I think that, and they're generally kind of encased. And it is like, they tend to be little parts. And it is, it's really like just a, like a big ribbon. And they're just, it's a constant ribbon. They go into the, in the plating tanks or little tiny little tanks in, inside of that. Uh, again, a requirement that based on the design of most continuous electrolytic <coughs> processes um, would meet the 75% of that because 75% of those continuous reels are gonna be covered um, in that. Here's one that's caused another confused, cyanide electroplating. Um, if you're doing cyanide electroplating, and let me make the distinction, not just any cyanide electroplating, only the cyanide that is using the HAPS covered by this rule. Okay, if you are doing silver cyanide plating, not covered by this rule. Okay, if you're doing tin cyanide plating, not covered by this rule. The cyanide plating that they're talking about is cyanide plating with the metal HAPS that are covered by this rule. Okay, now. For that, you have to make a measure of the pH at the initial startup of the bath. You're done. You don't have to have constant pH monitoring of the sign. And the reason why you need pH is concerned with it is that the big concern for cyanide is hydrogen cyanide gases coming off, and that's only going to occur at very low pHs. Um, so when you're doing cyanide plating, you got to make sure that your pH is, is high enough. But this requirement, and again, another kind of puzzling thing, it seems like an odd requirement. You do the pH monitoring once at the initial makeup of a bath. You know, and I'll tell you, just to give you this, for most plating baths, you're not making them up every day. I mean, some plating baths can last for months, years if they're properly managed and, and cleaned and, and all. So um, an interesting requirement, but two confusions on this. One is how often you have to do the pH monitoring on this. And number two, that it applies to all cyanide electroplating. It does not. Only those cyanide processes that have the metal halves. Okay, last part is dry mechanical polishing and thermal spray. Um, thermal spray is, a, is an interesting option. It has um, been used primarily with DOD um, as a replacement for hexavalent chromium for hard chrome plating. Um, it's a uh, high velocity oxygenated fuel is a HVOF. You may have seen that designation of it. Just to give you an idea, not a lot of people do it because most HVOF units are about a million dollars each. Um, and I remember going to an Air Force base out in Utah um, when we were doing a tour and we went to the area where they had their HVOF and I'm walking through there with several of these platers that have their small little shops, you know, a couple million dollars in annual revenues. And we had a room full of HVOF machines and they're just sitting there counting it up, you know, the millions of dollars that are sitting in front of them uh, in there. But it is a, uh, and most of the HVOF that is done it's done in a some sort of encased in, in thing or enclosed room on that. Um, but if you're doing that, you need to have the, the control. And if you're gonna spend a million dollars on HVOF, you're probably gonna have all the ancillary equipment that you need on that. Um, and it is done in some uh, aerospace and mostly DOD uh, facilities on that. But there are other ways to comply with that, but basically it's a some sort of a capture system with things. Yes, Tom. I'm assuming OSHA has standards that, gov that govern these processes <coughs> as well regarding uh, worker 
inspection? The question is uh, the assumption that OSHA has standards that protects workers on this. And the short answer is, is yes. There is a, um, was a revised in 2006, the hexavalent chromium workplace exposure standard. Um, there are other workplace exposure standards for other metals. Um, I will tell you that there really isn't a problem with most other metals on that in part. And something that OSHA has looked at, um, and they're looking to kind of revise those wherever they can. Uh, on that, there's a big controversy. On um, the last administration, uh, the OSHA administrator actually came out and said, all of our workplace exposure levels are out of date. And actually there was some interesting kind of enforcement uh, actions on, on that under the general duty clause under OSHA, um, is that employers should know that these things are out of date and if they're out of date, they're not protective of their employees and so they should in voluntarily impose a more stringent standard. And actually they cited a facility that met the regulations on the book, but because of this, they should have known that the standard that, that's on the books is not protective um, and they should have done something to protect their employees. Um, but yes, there are OSHA standards on this that are in place. Um, and that I will tell you from, from our industry standpoint, the primary one um, that, that they deal with is the hexavalent chromium standard. That's the, the one that would pose the most potential difficulty with them in, in terms of being Yes? In, um, when EPA promulgated this rule, did they work with OSHA and, and say, well, OSHA's already kind of covering this stuff, so that's maybe that's why the regulation is the question is did EPA work with OSHA in, in promulgating this rule and the short answer is no not really um, there are considerations but keep in mind there are two separate jurisdictions two separate missions um, they're often related and actually it's kind of a push me pull me kind of relationship between workplace exposure levels and air emissions levels just as a quick aside one way I can protect my employees is to have uh, local exhaust ventilation systems that I pull it all out so it's away from their breathing zones. The more stuff I pull out, where's that going? It's gonna go out my stack. It's gonna be part of my air emissions on that. Um, if I don't do that, if I'm not funneling a lot of that, that stuff on there and I wanna kind of reduce my air emissions, then I've got a potential problem with my workers in terms of that workplace exposure. So it's always been kind of a, you know, finding that, finding that happy meeting, make sure you're meeting, meeting both of them on that. And actually it's an interesting, another interesting aside for you. Um, as part of the chromium electroplating rule, we banned the use of PFOS based fume suppressants. Okay, that was the, the, the common work really best. PFOS is basically with the Scotch guard um, thing, very effective, but very persistent in the environment um, and some significant health issues associated with that. When the chromium electro the chromium hexavalent chromium workplace standard came into place, some people started using fume suppressants in there to help the workplace exposure. And so that was the way they got down when they banned the use of the PFOS fume suppressants, um, a lot of those folks began to have problems with workplace exposure levels. On that, so it is that this dynamic between workplace exposures and air emissions is, is real, and it's in a lot of different areas. Um, on that, you're going to find the same thing, whether it is the, the crystalline silica OSHA OSHA rule um, and PM emissions kind of thing. Same kind of same kind of dynamic and balance that we're always going to have. Um, for for polishing, um, if you're doing <coughs> polishing that's covered by the rule, um, you would need to have these controls. Now, to be covered by the rule under polishing, it has to be after plating, and it has to be dry mechanical polishing. If you use any kind of buffing agent, any kind of solvent, any kind of liquid in your polishing, you're not covered by this rule. So what do you think a lot of platers did that were doing polishing? <laughs> They added something to their polishing. They weren't doing, very few of them do dry mechanical polishing after plating anymore. They all started using some sort of buffing agent, um, some sort of solvent, some sort of solution as part of their polishing to get out of here. 
Okay. Turn to the notification requirements. The notification requirements are listed the same for, for all that. There's an initial notification on that. One of the things that we, we did as part of the rule, we did a model initial notification for our guys, sent it out to them and say, here, use this. One interesting note, many of you may have experienced it or your colleagues at your agencies may have experienced it. Um, the rule actually requires you send it to EPA and generally that's the EPA regions. We always told our folks, belts and suspenders, send to your states. Just let them know what's going on. When the rule first came out and people started sending notifications to the state agencies, a lot of them called them up and said, what is this? Why am I getting, why am I getting this notification? Um, over time, that's kind of came out, but it was new. It was new for everybody, and it was new for a lot of the states, and they weren't looking at this. We continue to tell our guys, and I think it's something that you can pass on. That any notifications you send, it's good to send both to EPA and the states. Whether they, whether they want it or not, whether it's required or not, it's just a good practice um, and good communication from a facility standpoint to do that. Basic information that's on there, but we have we have a model that we used, um, and then we'll get back to that. The other one is that um, you had to submit an initial notification of compliance status on that, uh, basically identifying your sources, the HAPs, and all that. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, if there's a problem with compliance, you're looking at it. Okay. This is probably the biggest area of non-compliance that I would guess, and I'm just basing this on knowing the industry as I do, and knowing that you know they're complying with the substitute standards, but a lot of these notifications aren't there. And then there's also an annual certification of compliance that you have to, to do on this. Um, the general provisions, I just put those up there, and these are applicable to all things, something you all are, are familiar with, that's all part of this, this rule, even though it's not in 6W. Um, there's references to it um, and, and some of those requirements. So, so where are we now? What is, um, the good news is, is that we have a great dialogue going among industry, small business, environmental assistance programs in Region 5, and EPA Region on this. It really, and, and I credit Renee and, and her crew for reaching out to us and continuing this, this process. We've had several calls. Uh, we've identified um, some things. And what we've been doing is trying to develop some guidance materials uh, for outreach on this. And what we what we've decided to do on this, and you know, initially when I when I heard this, I said, why are we dealing with this rule? Why is this rule important? Um, why is EPA region, why do they really care about this rule? There's no environmental benefit really from this. And on the flip side, there's no environmental degradation from non-compliance with this rule. Because if you look at the requirements of the rule, it, it's not designed to kind of reduce emissions or anything like that. And it was just, that's why my flippant answer is that, why are we here? I don't know. And that's kind of what I, what I was looking at. Why all the energy on this? Okay, I got over that, okay? Um, and part of it is that it never hurts to provide additional outreach, additional guidance to the industry on that. And we have to look at this as an opportunity. We're not getting an enforcement action. EPA Region 5 was, wasn't, you know, at the gates ready to, ready to roll. They were willing to let us do this. And so with the help of you folks, us to develop uh, some guidance materials, a rule summary and a checklist for facilities. And it's something we're working on, and the reason why it's held up, it's me. Um, I asked for more time to do it. Yes, right, it's me. Um, and I do have I, I do have some drafts that, are, that I'm working on, and I will get them to you. The other thing that we're working on is to prepare model notifications. We have one for initial notification, but we want to incorporate the uh, notice of compliance status into that. On that. With those tools, we're going to figure out the best approach for outreach to the industry, both from your perspective and from industry's perspective. And we've been talking about different ways to get the word out um, to this. And our outreach, from our standpoint, is gonna to go to our members and non-members. We have a lot of opportunities that we put a lot of our materials out in uh, Product Finishing Magazine, for example, that goes to 30,000 people 
uh, on that. So a lot of non-members get that information. Also, we've talked about working with, the, with, with you folks in terms of getting lists, particularly in your states, and finding ways uh, to do this. Also, looking in possibility some training sessions, um, things like, like this, but also uh, for EPA, we, one of the things we've asked EPA Region 5, maybe we could do something for inspectors uh, on this and, and try to further outreach um, on this. So I'm very impressed with the work that you all have done to kind of move this along. And I'm very appreciative of it because it's made my life a lot easier and it's a win-win um, on this. Uh, again, like I said, I could have sat there and just fought this and said, no, it's not a problem or anything like that. I still believe there's not a problem, but it doesn't hurt. And this is good communication. Yes, sir. Did you submit reg reform comments on this? The question is, did we submit reg reform um, comments on it? Yes, we did. And, and the gist of our comments was, we're asking, we, we kind of, went through this, we, we identified the fact that we're working with you guys on this, and we asked EPA to provide clarification on this rule, and specifically clarification on the minimal requirements, I think that's the language I used, the minimal requirements of this, this rule um, on that, so. And with that, that's all I have in the room. I just very quickly, I just want a couple of things that as an industry we are doing too that's kind of, shows some of the reasons why we have those reductions on that and continue to. This is um, our grant with EPA um, Region 5 on this, and it's a P2 grant, and it is focused in Region 5 and even more focused in the state of Michigan on that, and that's just kind of the way the grant was set up. But what we're doing in there, we've been sending out um, P2 surveys to, we sent out about 600 different job shops on there. Um, and I know one of the discussions we had about sending out a survey about three, um, and I will tell you, of those 600 that we sent out, I think we got about 35 responses back so far. And I'm almost embarrassed to tell you this, uh, we were continuing to work on that and reaching out to our members and our chapters on that. But the idea is that we're trying to generate data from the job shop in terms of what P2 uh, practices they're doing. But these are very detailed surveys with very detailed questions. It's not like yes or no for most of them. It's a very, like it's a process to answer this survey. The, the comment was that these surveys that we're talking about are very detailed surveys. Um, yes and no. They're more detailed than, than your average survey. They're our phase one <laughs> survey. If you answer the phase one, we send you a really long phase two um, on this. Now, part of it is that our incentive, our pollution prevention manual out here, for those facilities that sent in phase one survey, we send them a free copy of the P2 manual um, on this. And I'll make an offer to you. Um, if you don't have this and you want it, let me know. We'll give you, we'll, we'll get one to you, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a great document. Thing like that but one of the things we're going to be doing with, and why are we giving them away um, one it's a good idea but we got a lot of them and we're going to be updating it too as part of this this process on there but as a, it's a good resource so if anybody wants one let me know and we'll we'll get it to you what do you think the, um, the, what, what do you think the main barrier is to getting um, the, the, the players to, to fill out this survey besides the obvious that they're small business and they're trying to you know continue their business and they've got a lot of stuff on their plate do you think is there anything that that you consider a, a bigger barrier and how are you trying to overcome that the question is uh, what is the, the barrier to uh the job shops responding to our survey um i think some of the ones that you identified are the are the real reason number two and this is something we hear from our, our guys all the time they get a zillion emails and a half a zillion emails from us on that, and it's getting them to focus. Because I go and talk to groups and they said, did y'all receive our survey that we sent you? And they'll go, no, no, I didn't, 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 never saw that. You know, they said, well, could you check, number one, and number two, I will send you, like, and we, we, we sent hard copies, and we also have an online version of it. Um, and the other part is that, 
I really don't know why they're not doing it. I mean, I, I go to groups and we have people that are very supportive and, and, you know, and they said either I didn't get it or I haven't got around. Now the other part of it is that it is, it's a lot of work to do this phase one. And we have on the online versions, we've had people that opened it and started it and stopped. Okay. So that's a pretty good indication that we're, you know, that we know that it's a, it's, it's a burden for them to, to do this. And we're working, we're working on ways to kind of get it everywhere I go. And I talk to our groups, I do that. And I said, what can we do to make it easy for you? You know, and what we're trying to do is that they get stuff from us directly. I try to send it to their local people who then send it to them. And sometimes they get less material from their local people and they're more likely to. So we're, we're working on it. Our goal is to get up to about a hundred. Um, and that's, we're, we're continuing to, we're, we're going all out on that, trying to get those, those numbers up. Because the reason why is that the validity of whatever we generate from this is going to be better if we have more. Um, survey response. Now we're working on some alternatives. Yes. I'm not that familiar with the survey survey surveys. They're a lot of you know people that are not really interested in doing that. Yeah. And I think it's a lot of the the question is uh, is there a lot of proprietary issues with the the industry um, that's kind of preventing the, some of the responses? The answer is yes and no. Um, a lot of some some of the data that they're asking for sales information and all they're reluctant to give it now it's all blind when we get it um and, and we put it we put it in blind we have facility numbers on there but i will tell you and we have to be careful on it um there are some facilities that only do specialty things and if you really know what you're doing you'd be able to identify that facility um, and we're very sensitive to that um but for the most part it's not a a highly proprietary the processes are the same everybody does something a little bit different and I will tell you every plater is different in terms of his or her willingness to share what they do welcome somebody else into their facility and then you find it in all industries of the industries that we deal with I will tell you the plating industry is probably one of the most open welcoming uh, industries and the reason for that is because very few of them are direct geographic competitors, okay? Because everybody's got just a slightly different mix. So you'll find 10 platers in, a, in, in close proximity to each other, and they may share some customers on that. They may do similar processes, but none of them do the same mix of everything on that. Um, and when we see direct competitors, there's you know, somebody in New York and somebody in California that are doing the same thing and have the same kind of global customer, everything like that. So it's a, but I would say it's a very, very open and welcoming industry. An aside for you just to kind of understand these guys, um, fires are a common thing in that because of the uh, rectifiers and electricity that they, they use. And historically, if somebody's place burned down, um, instances, and not just one, but several instances where another player says, hey, while you're down, I'll take your customers. I'll do your plating for you and, and do your customers. You can keep keep going and, and, and like that. You get back up on the thing. And then when you're when you're back up, you have them back. Um, it happens a lot. In one case, I know a guy did that and the customer said, see, I don't want to go back to him. I really like you and I really like what you're doing. He said, no, I'm not going to do any more of your work. You're not my customer. And the only reason I took you on was to help this guy out. Um, so it is, it's, it's that kind of a industry. And part of it is that, you know, when you're small, you, you gotta, you gotta find help wherever you can uh, on this. Now, a couple of the other things that we're doing as part of this P2 is some demonstration projects. One of the things we've, we've kind of switched a little bit to demonstration projects and case studies in part, because if our survey numbers are lower, um, then we gotta find other ways to demonstrate some of the P2 technologies. Um, on that. Now the P2 technologies that we're, we're looking at, some of them are the standard ones, um, reduced water, everything like that. But some of the more innovative ones are different chemistries that are being used and different sequencing of the chemistries on, on that. And a lot of it leads to, I mean, for example, one general um, pollution prevention thing, which is kind of, they've learned over time. It used to be, if you're plating, 
the more metal you had in solution, the better it would be, right? And you think, hey, I got more metal in there, it'll be easier to get on the parts. What they realize is that there's an optimum amount of metal that you need in your plating bath. And anything more than that is just wasted. It's not going anywhere. And so looking at the concentrations of bath that are most effective on that, lowering the amount of chemicals that you need, lowering the amount of metals that you need in your solution, that's something that they've been doing more and more. Um, the other thing that we're going to be doing, we're doing a benchmarking practice, um, getting that data, we're able to kind of say, here's where the industry standard is, here are the top performers are, and people can take their own data and kind of see where they are. We've done this in the past, we had a benchmarking study, a really valuable um, thing. Interesting to note, and I think someone mentioned it early on, one of the results from the benchmarking study was those people that spend more on pollution prevention and environmental controls had better bottom lines were much more profitable companies. Um, it was really a strong message to give um, to the industry. A couple of other things that, that we're hoping to get out of the grant, um, additional information on our web resource, and I'll talk about that next very quickly, and new training curriculum. Our uh, association does a lot of educational training, technical training on that, and we'll be able to update our, our P2 course as a result of that. I mentioned the uh, Resource Center. Um, some of you may have been familiar with the National Metal Finishing Resource Center. It's part of one of the EPA co uh, Compliance Assistance Centers that came out of the Common Sense Initiative. This one is still going. Um, it has come under somewhat of a disrepair over years. EPA's funding has, has shrunk, and so, Actually, NASF has stepped in to partner with the National Center for Manufacturing Science who's been doing this, and EPA uh, to infuse more funding and some more technical um, information. And what this is, is, uh, it is it's a resource center. Anything metal finishing is, is on there. Um, we are in the process, uh, we have uh, changed the name and branding to it. It is now the Surface Technology Environmental Resource Center. It's kind of a an early draft of what the, the page looked like. I encourage you to get on there. Um, there's some great tools for you to, to use um, on there. Um, we are continuing to add things. We're gonna be putting more technical information on there, but it is a great place to start. Um, it, just calculators for, plating calculators in terms of you know, what you need in your plating bath. Um, I might mention, I think we're on there, we're linked to that site. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been, Nancy and I have been meeting with Bill. Shenover? Uh, yes, and George Kushney. Quarterly to try to see how we can um, work together with the Compliance Assistance Centers. And so I know we've asked them to. Okay. This. Yeah, that's good. Actually, one of the things that's on there, um, it, state programs are, there's links to that on there. And it's, I mean, I'm, um, these are some of the features on there, but just to, to encourage you, um, uh, this is just a plug. Our big trade show is in Atlanta this year. Anybody in the area you want to come by, um, see what we do? Um, if it's a matter of cost, we had a Georgia person here. She's here. Please come and see us. Um, we'd love to have you. If you, if you want a free registration, let me know, okay? Because we, that's it. That's it. All right. make, sure, make sure I get your card and we'll get, we'll get you hooked up. It's, it, it, you know, we're, we're doing a lot, of, a lot of exciting things with focusing on some of our supply chain. One of the things we've hooked up at the Automotive Industry Action Group, uh, who represents uh, the OEMs and the Tier 1 suppliers in that. Uh, we're doing a, a plating workshop for them. Um, on that, uh, but there's a big push in the automotive, particularly down in the southeast. Um, but just excuse the commercial plug on there. Just more information. There's both the uh, NASF website and the STERC website. STERC website www.sterc.org. And with that, I'll be happy to entertain any additional questions or comments. Well, what do you think? Um, What's your thoughts on what Region 5 is trying to do with their efforts to, to get out to the plating company to evaluate compliance with this rule? Their thoughts on the survey thing and um, the outreach materials they're kind of trying to plug uh, state SBs to 
this system with. Um, and I've been part of that conversation. The, the question is what do you think that EPA Region 5 is really trying to do with its its yeah, effort, I mean, both, in, both in the enforcement the side and kind of this outreach uh, yeah, side? Yeah, it's going to be worthwhile. Well, I think from my take is we're kind of, we're trying to do it as one and the same. That, you know, they're trying to use these surveys to justify no additional effort is needed. Um, you know, that they want us to distribute uh, surveys to the industry and, and just kind of help them support that position, I think, and, and along with additional outreach materials on what 6W is. Um, so if they're not in compliance, then they can get in compliance, including helping them notify. Um, so I guess we'll, we have any thoughts on that. Well, the, the question is additional thoughts in terms of kind of what's going on and what the, the value of doing um, surveys and all. And I, I will tell you, I told Renee and Jennifer this on our, on our call, as an industry, we are vehemently opposed to any surveys and, and part of it is that I just don't think it's a, a, a good effort number one number two anybody who's going to answer that survey who's going to answer that survey those folks that are in compliance with the rule yes I'm in compliance with the rule if I'm not in compliance with that rule do you think I'm going to answer that survey there's no way that I'm going to answer that survey and I will tell you as an industry there's no way I'm going to advise our members to answer a survey like that um, but Let's put the survey aside from that. There's a lot of other ways to do this. And again, EPA Region 5 initially in looking at, that's what they do, okay? Enforcement, you go out and look, people in compliance with this rule. 